Hello and welcome to a new uh, series of interviews and uh, profiles with global leaders in different areas of the industries. Um, my name is Dinis Guarda and this is Cities ABC uh, video and podcast series. And we're here to talk about ideas and how we can actually tackle the challenges and the solutions to the problems that humanity is facing. Our project and actually platform, Cities ABC, has been growing to become a platform about cities, about citizens, and as well, how can we use most of the fourth industrial revolution and society 5.0 technologies to improve and to enhance all our society. And normally we've been profiling, I think right now we're going close to 50 interviews with global leaders that are coming from a lot of different industries, from FinTech to blockchain, to as well normal CEOs and different areas. And we've been actually uh, accelerating uh, a lot of interesting insights from how we can actually look at the issues like COVID-19, digital transformation, how FinTech is changing the world and shaping new solutions, but as well a more positive way of looking at our present and especially how to build a better future. So um, today I welcome Sandra Tobler, the CEO and founder of Futurai. That is a, a fintech uh, company uh, based in Switzerland and uh, um, quite interesting in, in terms of the things they are doing, especially in, in terms of a, a suite of adaptive modular multi-factor uh, authentication and transaction tools that I think are very interesting for companies uh, in the areas of finance and technology. And uh, about Sandra, uh, welcome to our, our podcast, Sandra, first of all. Thank you, Denise. Nice being here. Yeah, so Sandra is uh, an international uh, leader in technology and, and finance. Uh, she's an entrepreneur who has been working in the IT space for many years. Uh, she worked with IBM in various international roles since 2007 before. And then she joined CSG uh, e, and later the, the State Secretary of Foreign Affairs, where she ruled the expertise for the IT industry and consults Swiss IT companies in international strategies. And of course, she has been behind Futurai, um, that has been a fast growing company um, that uh, we're going to be talking today. And I think as well as a leader in fintech, I want to talk as well about how he, she sees fintech, a lot of different things. So Sandra, welcome to our podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Great being so, here. Great. So uh, we are all a bit uh, closed in the house or different things because of COVID-19. But, uh, but in one end, uh, I think uh, all the, the things that you are working with your technology, with your background, are becoming more important than ever. Because, of course, right now, the society is becoming completely digital. We're creating digital twins. But we have a lot of challenges still. And actually, COVID-19 highlighted a lot of possibilities, but as well, there's a lot of problems to be tackled and a lot of actually issues still that we're facing. So I want to start with a bit of your background uh, and in the introduction in terms of your studies, in terms of what you've been doing so far, and as well, um, how did you come right now to this position, if you can tell us a bit about that background. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I studied international relations with a specialty also in IT. And um, after I joined really IBM, where I learned the IT industry end to end, like hardware, <laughs> server side, but also to, to the services and um, worked in many large international projects. And um, yeah, all through my experience in IT, I would say I've always figured out that IT security was treated as something that is um, like a rather a check on a list uh, of a compliance department than anything that enables a product uh, inherently or that like um, is a design integral part of a design and, and that's something that actually stuck me and and i was with everything that is going on uh, on the other hand where you want to create more personalized services more touch points with users uh, for customer facing applications. If it's a, it's a cross industry, right? It's um, especially in financial services. This is kind of something that is not working anymore with, with something static and something that's just for, for pre compliance. But um, it was, I thought it's a very interesting space to innovate in like optimizing usability and security at the same time for customer facing applications. And so this is what Futuray does. Um, I met my two co-founders in, in the US back then, and um, they were just coming out of research, really looking into the same area. 
and um, yeah, we found each other and we're excited about the same topic and um, there, there we went off. And so it, we gave each other, we gave us um, for this venture a half a year to see if we have some kind of market feedback. So which uh, we would have uh, translated in investor interest or uh, customers. And we said, if, if this is not going to happen, we're going to let it die. Then it was just an interesting phase. Uh, but um, if there is market interest, um, we're definitely going to pursue it. And that's what happened. And um, yeah, now we are four years in almost. Amazing. So, so um, you are based in Switzerland, uh, Sandra, and then as well, you have quite a, an interesting background from both IBM, but as well working with the governments and, and things like that. Can you tell us about education? Because I think it's quite interesting. We've been interviewing people from all over the world, but each country has different uh, specification and different context. I know that the Swiss education is very powerful uh, as well. Um, and I think I want to bridge a bit the, the financial education and as well probably the technology education a bit. I, I hear from your background. I think that's particularly interesting. And as well, being a woman, uh, a woman in, in finance and technology as well is an interesting overview because we have more and more. But there's a lot of uh, still interesting, different ways of looking at these areas. I mean, I would say we are privileged in Switzerland to have a really um, great education system that is inclusive, like compared to the US, where it's really, uh, unfortunately, only for a limited amount of privileged people, like very qualitative uh, education. Um, however, I think also during the COVID-19 days, it became very clear that digitization is something that is not just nice to have but it's really what every organization needs, needs to embrace full force um, and i think there we still have some areas where we have to catch up because uh, what it showed is during those those days that it depended very much on the individual either regional organization or even teacher if they had put into place um, where children could um, keep on working in a collaborative way um, through digital channels or if they were totally um, basically left with their parents to teach them from a, a printed <laughs> documentation uh, for the time. And um, so this is a huge accelerator for this trend and a huge, I would say, recognizing, especially on um, the decision-taking level, that it's not a cosmetic uh, element to have uh, digital channels in place. It's not nice to have, but it is really a must for um, the modern way of collaboration to also provide to the students a uh, chance to interact um, digitally and um, to the teachers to, to enable them bottom up. Very interesting. And, and I think. Uh... One of the things I've been seeing, especially, especially from uh, German-speaking countries and Switzerland, you are in Zurich, is that there's a huge uh, balance between business and academic world research. Do you come as well from an academic background or you've been more industry focused on that level? I think we have uh, the combination of all these elements, which is uh, making us fairly, fairly well positioned. Uh, my two co-founders, they really have a PhD from the security department of ETH Zurich, which is a very renowned IT um, university, technical university here in Zurich. Um, so they studied um, computer science and specialized in um, like one more on the online security side and the other uh, more on the mobi mobile side. And um, yeah, myself, I come more from the industry. So I, have, I, I had financial services clients. Uh, I was like very early on in this uh, fintech movement in Zurich when, when, I mean, it was kind of an obvious movement since we have a lot of financial services in Switzerland. Um, we have a lot of IT in Switzerland and kind of we need to bridge. And we had so-called fintech for, for years. Um, however, uh, I would say beginning of maybe 2010, uh, we started to call this fintech. So it was um, like a new wave of especially also uh, people leaving financial industry and starting to innovate. And yeah, so from that point of view, I think we have a combination. And, and of course, another um, early colleague um, and comes from the insurance industry background. So we have really uh, with banking, insurance and the academic bridge 
and we still have a professor from the computer uh, system security department of ETH in our board. So with these elements, we have a very, very strong foundation in both worlds. Oh, very interesting. So before we go to the um, your company and as well what you guys have been doing, can you tell us a bit of the context about Swiss, uh, Switzerland and fintech? And as well, I think in mm -hmm. your case, your your company touches a lot of different areas of fintech from from uh, cybersecurity that she's just mentioned, but as well a lot of different layers from compliance, security, and a lot of even infrastructure. So a bit mm -hmm. of the background, how do you see the the context of Switzerland and fintech? I think Switzerland has an extremely interesting ecosystem in the fintech space since a lot of the founders come with a financial background, be it insurance or, or financial services itself. So they detected some element they want to solve, they're excited about a problem um, that they experienced firsthand and that's how they start with their venture. Um, so it's more, I would say, mature compared to just... Um, I don't want to be um, like it's, it's not better or worse it's just very close to industry um, so innovating and um, by knowing the industry and also having a network in the industry of course it's also comparatively more easy to get access to some um, first early movers for your technology and you're a lot faster in doing product market fit um, this also helped future a in the early days um, so we, we have I would say a very difficult start from a like point of view what we do so we secure the most sensitive interfaces of banks which are e-banking mobile banking interfaces towards the customers so i would say this is like the achilles uh, first of, of the bank if this does not work it's a uh, game over so users cannot log in users cannot sign uh, transactions uh, yeah so it's, it's a very very sensitive element and um, yeah, we were privileged to, to have some financial organizations that very early on trusted in us. I think also uh, because of this mix of security know-how we brought um, to the table uh, paired with industry knowledge and um, they gave us um, the chance to prove that we can deliver with our technology. And uh, ever since then, um, yeah, it became a lot easier, of course, if you have a few strong references in the market. And I would say, to come back to the question about how, how the Zurich ecosystem is, I mean, we really have a few uh, massive successes here um, in Zurich. Uh, we're maybe a bit more understatement under the radar compared to other um, ecosystems like London or, or Singapore or even Berlin. Um, uh, but uh, we are not behind at all from the maturity. Oh, very interesting. And, and as well, so one of the things I want to touch and I think that, that brings us to Futurai is that Switzerland, of course, has been the epicenter of banking industry and finance for the last 100 years or 200, actually, but especially in the last 100 years. And as well, I know that, uh, that especially in the last years, there's been a kind of a, um, a race towards improving fintech integration and as well a lot of companies, but there's still a lot of challenges in multiple different things. So I know that at Futurai you are creating and you've been having some awards both in cybersecurity but as well in banking integration. So how do you see traditional finance and companies like yours? And as well, how do you integrate the multiple products that you're doing with Futurai? I would say um, for us financial services is uh, so interesting since in our area, in strong customer authentication and transaction signing, banks are by far the most advanced uh, with maturity of their infrastructure. So they have been heavily integrated, um, heavily regulated, um, they have been um, pushed to be innovative, um, they're a lot more used to um, renew their infrastructure compared to other industries. And so for us, it's like a very interesting space because um, we have um, a fast innovation cycle with our product. So we are a SaaS company, but for us, it's really the core philosophy is in cybersecurity, you need to be able to react fast, uh, be it through um, operation, operating system changes, be it through new threat models that come up. Um, so it's something like compared to the typical IT infrastructure where you have long-term projects that take you a year um, from design to bringing it into production, um, in this new world of, again, having 
um, you want to briefly, you have microservices, you want to build um, briefly touch points you want to do. You have a lot of banks have now um, agile models where they're going to iterate quickly on your product lines. They want to brief, bring it out, they do A-B testing, they, they iterate. Um, so this doesn't work anymore with the old world of IT. And um, that's why it's also from that angle very interesting um, since we can bring really the speed um, to underlie the new product lines of security. So one of the things that uh, Futurai Technologies AG is specifically focused is the areas of secure authentication and integration precisely with, with the banking systems and banking infrastructure. Can you tell us about this authentication um, and how you see as well the industry going in that direction? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, there again, in the past, you always had to decide you want to have a secure system or you want to have a user-friendly system. Um, this is, I would say, something that changed a lot. Um, the users are of today, they're used to use services um, of American tech companies. Um, they have Slack, they have Apple products, they have um, Google products. So things are extremely seamless. And um, when they go back to their, to their home bank, uh, their retail bank, their um, private bank, <clears throat> they have the same expectations towards the products. <clears throat> of user interactions and of seamless um, way of creating an account, migrating their account. And so the old way of doing um, security is just not working anymore. And um, so at FutureRay, we, we offer a modular authentication portfolio <clears throat> for both logging and transaction signing that really gives um, an organization the flexibility to change authentication methods over time they have everything at hand, um, they can parameterize, they have maybe different user groups that can be served differently uh, with different authentication methods, but also with the flows. Because uh, what we figured out is that a, lor a large majority of financial services companies <clears throat> is struggling with a lot of incoming support calls. <clears throat> so um, if, you if you think 40% of all the inbound calls to your help desk are related to login, this is a massive cost driver. And um, what we do help our customers is really um, how can we enable the user to always find a way to log in intuitively. So for the high frequent users of services, but also for the ones that only come a few times a year or once a year um, so that they don't forget their login credentials. Because if you log in once a year, you will not remember your passwords typically. Um, but also the second factor of authentication. And so we make things passwordless, we make things intuitive that you don't feel the second factor um, or give alternatives how to secure transactions um, in an easy way um, while always at the highest level of security um, for software-based solutions. And we have also complemented the portfolio with hardware tokens um, since again, also banks typically want to have a variety of use cases served um, they have also corporate clients that typically want to have something physical that they can store away. And um, our mo modular solution really allows all these type of use cases to be served. And that's something that our customers appreciate a lot. So one of the things, um, especially that is on the base of your technology is the open APIs and everything that relates with these solutions. Um, can you just bring, and I think, I think everyone, especially in our audience, is more a technology audience, but there's different layers of knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. that we have a lot of different velocities in the world because you mentioned tokens, and I want to uh, go on that direction a while, but uh, there's still a lot of velocities when it comes to banking. There's some bankings uh, that have very strong um, integration in open APIs and APIs in general. There's some that are really still lacking, lay behind. And as well, we have a lot of issues uh, when it comes to cybersecurity in general. So I want to, first of all, let, let's go to the open APIs or APIs. Um, mm -hmm. What's your view on open APIs for banking and you guys being as well a provider of these solutions through APIs and as well solutions that integrate, especially the most important thing that is the area of cybersecurity, as well the area how you go through the possibilities that can come, for instance, from gathering the data from this, the, the clients but as well protecting the data. So I would like to have your overview on that because this is kind of the future of banking, but very few people are conscious about all the different nuances. 
uh, and even big banks that are starting to integrate this, they have massive issues with cybersecurity mm -hmm. and so forth. And we've been seeing this, especially in the last couple of years. Absolutely. I would say open finance is extremely interesting. Um, however, not for everyone, which is perfectly fine in my view. What I think is very important is that you have know-how in-house as a bank to take this deliberate decision, do you want to go down that road or not? Like, um, do you want to build products um, integrating with other services? Maybe not even fi in the financial space, because then it gets even more interesting. Um, but you need to take a deliberate decision. And in order to take a deliberate decision, you need to have the know-how. What I see, however, is that a lot of financial institutions that say, we don't want to do it, and we want to block or want to lobby against um, opening APIs, maybe don't have the knowledge in-house. And that's something that is for me not um, acceptable. Um, since, again, it's not just um, opening doors to, to the big tech companies. It's really also building a strong ecosystems uh, in view of serving the consumer in a better way. And there, I think you need to do your home, homework before you can take decisions and say, or even iterate and test things before you can take a decision. Um, in our space, concretely, um, PSD2, of course, is a big topic um, since uh, RTS is uh, giving a reference in the documentation from ABA to uh, that companies have to implement strong customer authentication for transactions, um, which causes some, especially in countries like Germany, it's a big, big uh, issue since they have done typically step ups. They didn't do strong authentication during the login, but only later. So the whole infrastructure is um, geared toward that approach. And um, now they have to change um, the philosophy. Uh, other countries are also struggling on, on other levels. Um, for us, I think it's very interesting since a lot of the organizations are struggling because they fear that they have more user friction. And this is exactly what, what our strength is, that we can help um, mitigate that um, it's not more user friction, but typically we even improve the user experience, even compared to lower security. Because um, across Europe, we, we replace a lot of SMS-based solutions. So where um, banks used SMS as a separate second factor um, to send codes to the user um, to secure their transactions or even the login. And um, as everyone in the industry knows, it's, SMS is not secure uh, for various reasons. Um, you can do large scale attacks. Um, you can do near t targeted attacks. Um, so it's really an old infrastructure that was never made for security. And um, also it's costly. You have to pay for every single SMS. Um, SMS is not reliable as a channel. Sometimes the codes, security codes arrive, sometimes they don't arrive. So it's really like legacy work. And um, there we can, could really also prove to a lot of customers we've already went into production that actually this new framework that they were so scared uh, that bring them more friction and less user acceptance can actually improve their infrastructure tremendously uh, in our uh, space of authentication. And so from that point of view, for us, it's of course a super interesting time. So I have um, <clears throat> one question on that. I completely agree with what you said, that I think the banks and the financial organizations that are not taking technology serious, they will disappear. There's no doubts about it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you touched as well the, <clears throat> that the global players are taking over. And there's no doubt uh, Facebook has been trying to launch Libra and, and as well leading a lot of these things. Uh, Google has already completed payment is infrastructure. Amazon is actually, by a lot of studies, the biggest fintech loan provider in the world. Um, and I'm not even talking about China with Alibaba and WeChat that we pay that are right now on financials, the biggest corporations in China and some of the biggest in the world. Mm -hmm. So we have still, nevertheless, um, a lot of resistance from a lot of CEOs and management of big banks and big financial organizations, especially the conventional ones that have been going through hundreds of years of history. So mm -hmm. how do you explain that for these institutions? Because it's obvious that they will disappear. For instance, just an interesting example, if you look at the, the valuation of a major bank uh, in Europe, or actually even one of the top 10 or top 20, and you compare it with the top 10 tech companies, they're like a tiny percentage. Mm -hmm. um, so it's becoming really irrelevant, uh, not irrelevant because that's a bit of a paradox between the way financial regulators are still going after the big banks and then we have the tech guys coming and disrupting. And then of course companies like you that are making the bridge because you're not really trying to disrupt the bank industry, you're trying to help them. 
So mm-hmm. how do you see this this balance in the ecosystem? Because I think that's a build that's a big imbalance, especially for us if you look at WeChat and China that becoming the biggest fintech player in the world, and their mm-hmm. technology is much more advanced than Europe, and the US is even worse in a lot of ways. And if you go to Latin America, there's a lot of velocity. So I would like to hear your views, especially being in Switzerland, that is a financial capital uh, by all means. Mm, absolutely, I think there are a few reasons why <clears throat> a lot of banks still struggle to embrace um, digital or um, let's say it's not fully, the buy-in is not there of the decision takers. Um, I mean, it still stuck me, stuck to, to my mind uh, a discussion I had with um, a C-level, like a deputy CEO of, of one of the largest banks of the UK um, some time ago. And I asked him like, yeah, to, to what extent is uh, cybersecurity data privacy on your radar? And we, we were in a context where we could have an unfiltered discussion. Um, and then also like going to the fintech space, like to what extent are you looking at your business models and um, to new ways of collaboration? And he told me, look, Sandra, um, in all honesty, I don't care about digitization. Um, and it's, uh, what I have to say is it's from the outside view, it's comparatively fairly advanced financial institution. Like from the perception, I would say they do a good job comparatively. So the deputy CEO t- told me, um, comparatively, I don't have time to spend on this. Uh, I have my shareholders. I have um, once a year, typically a lunch with a big four representative. And he feels maybe they know what's happening. So wow. I was, uh, this, this <laughs> I was a, 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 like <laughs> some time back, I have to say. That's uh, scary. <laughs> but it's scary. It's really scary. So um, that, that that's kind of, I would say one type of um, yeah, typical behavior of, of um, decision takers. Others are well aware of what's happening, but they don't care because turnover, as we all know, in financial services is fairly quick. Um, so they know by the time this is going to, um, as we say in German, when shit hits the fan, they're not there anymore. And that's a bit um, what I reproach to, to some of the financial services representatives, that they don't care. Uh, because now they have the power to um, build strong partnerships, to build infrastructure for the future, to, to build maybe also new channels, how to, to communicate with their consumers, to find new pools of consumers. Um, now there is, still pos- there is still the possibility, but you have to care and you have to own it. And it's not some, something you can delegate to, to an IT department. You have to own this as a, as a decision taker, as the leader of your organization. Um, and there, yeah, with, with of course some some uh, brilliant exceptions, we have some very very amazing uh, people in this industry. But I would say there is a bit of a tendency um, for for the latter, and um, that's a bit yeah, it's a bit sad because um, also this whole debate fintech versus bank was for me so useless since, as you rightfully so said, it was never about a fintech, especially in Europe, replacing financial services because um, all fintech um, entrepreneurs um, to a large extent in my in my network that I know want is really they come from the financial industries, they see um, elements they want to further improve and um, to help making financial services um, in all the different verticals more sustainable and um, more future proof. And so it's a huge chance of missed opportunity if you, if you don't then embrace those interactions. And um, I would say a lot happened since the early days and uh, financial organizations are a lot um, like familiar in doing successful collaborations with, with fintechs, um, which is a, it's a great development um, that has come a long way, um, but there can still happen more um, in that respect, especially, especially in, in the area of speed, um, how to iterate, how to quickly evaluate technology uh, to decide if it's yes or no and um, to feedback honestly to companies uh, but then also to uh, let things die uh, without that it has any impact on, on employees within a bank if something doesn't work out you can take it as a learning um, but um, that brings you forward overall and that's also really a culture that depends very much on which organization we talk about it is not fully um, on there yet where you yeah what would a lot um, make a difference in terms of improving the innovation ca- capacity in-house? 
um, especially in our space in cybersecurity, um, talent is one of the scarce uh, resource you, you have today. Every bank I know is struggling to find um, chief information security officers, uh, good security officers, um, data privacy responsibles. Um, I think there are also banks on, and financial services institutions need to rethink the way of how to, to approach talent. You don't have to necessarily hire someone to have them in your ecosystem. You can also build partnerships, especially with, with um, cybersecurity startups that have very strong uh, foothold in one vertical and knowledge in one vertical. Um, you can bind them to you, uh, which is A, cheaper for you. Uh, you have um, maybe, uh, you can cross leverage knowledge across competitors of yours since they know uh, what works and doesn't. It's not just a, in, like from within the organization, the knowledge. And also you have access to always the latest knowledge since um, cybersecurity companies in, in a very specific space might be very well connected to industry and academic research in that respect. So um, I think banks also need to uh, rethink the way they, they try to uh, get access to, to talent and make them work for them. Yeah, completely. So, so I, I'm completely with you and I think I even would go a bit probably more radical because I, I see Tell that, me. that <laughs> no, no, I, I'm talking because I work with multiple countries and um, in some cases I've actually been working very close with prime ministers and, and presidents. And one of the things I've been finding out is that this is not just with the banks, this is with the entire countries. And for mm -hmm. instance, I want to just be a bit provocative, but as well to push you as well to the discussion, as well as an expert in both building the technology, but as well, uh, I know that your company has been winning some awards and accolades as well, you, yourself. But what I found out, and, and actually this is my experience, both working with bigger banks and as well governments, is that there's an entire challenge with digital transformation. Okay? And this is a challenge that is much bigger than we think. Because for instance, uh, just an example, at the moment, the world economy is under one of the biggest financial crises and, and actually health crises in history, probably in the last 200 years, let's put it that way. But we are all still, of course, uh, thanks, we still have food and different things, but in, actually in emerging countries, things are a bit more tricky. But what happened is that, for instance, if you look at Apple, Apple has around close to $200 billion of money in cash reserves. And most of the countries are actually full of debt. So, we have not only a paradox in terms of the present and future of money in terms of the, the technology, but as well the funds and as well the complexity of people not understanding what you're talking about. And that's part of the, I would actually, I know that you work with the Swiss government. So I would like to understand your view on this because I think, for instance, I wrote my book, Fourth Industrial Revolution, um, How to Reinvent the Nation. It's precisely my experience, frustrated experience, let's, let's put it that way, mm -hmm. of trying to, I thought, okay, I thought we are already more advanced, but we're not. Uh, and even if you see what is happening right now with COVID-19 is that, for instance, in the UK where I am, which is probably the fifth economy or sixth in the world, the children don't even have capacity to have school remotely, which is mm. completely ridiculous. We have Zoom, we have all these tools. So this is actually, it touches the entire society. But when it comes to banking, it's more dangerous because of, in the end of the day, any bank is dealing with data and is dealing with money. Money first, of course. Uh, data, they don't understand the value of that, most of them. So I want to hear your views on this because this for me and one of, uh, that's the reason actually we create this podcast and as well that we are speaking with a lot of different people from different industries because it's really necessary to alarm and as well make these people, uh, when I say alarm is alert, but alarm them as well in the sense that this is, there's a sense of urgency as well. And as well, like uh, um, Professor Arar, um, the, the writer of the 20 lessons for, for the 20th century, one of the things he says, and actually wrote a couple of essays on this, we're going to have a kind of a, the next 10 years, we're going to have like a kind of new colonization. Uh, mm -hmm. That will be about data and about technology. And of course, the countries or they are in the institutions that will be running these will be running the world. And they are already running the world. So, yeah, I would like to hear your views because I know that Switzerland has been trying to create a process of digital transformation. You are as well working with major institutions. You are part of the ecosystem. But we are exceptions, unfortunately. So how do you tackle this? And as well, how can we be more provocative as an industry? What, what I think is, um, what I just said about the financial industry and ownership and leadership in that respect, um, where I see issues, to be honest, financial services are comparatively at the forefront of digitization. So the infrastructure we're talking about there 
that is still facing some some inherent um, problems and and cultural issues is however comparatively fairly advanced um what i always um advocated is that governance, governments should really be the ones trying out technology early on. They need to build capacity in-house to understand what are potentials or also uh, pitfalls um, embracing technology. And it's not good enough to just have like an external commission that validates it uh, with representative from, from the private industry. No, this ha has to happen inherently. Like how does it come that governments across the globe are not capable of highlighting pioneering technologies from their home countries? This is something mind-boggling to me. Uh, how can it be that they don't have the capacity and, and the, the private sector manages? So across the industry, um, I would say governments are lagging behind in many respects. If you look at education, as you mentioned, rightfully so, um, but also in the health sector, in, in a lot of areas, uh, especially e-government services. How can it be I still have to go physically to places? How can it be, especially in COVID times, that it cannot be um, the governmental organizations that are innovating and are the first ones um, looking at, at how to improve interactions with their citizens? Um, this is, to me, mind-boggling and, and really a, a big issue we have everywhere. And um, again, I understand it. it's not a it's not a trivial um, area because also um, there are costs involved, and uh, other industries might have more funds to invest in infrastructure. But especially there, I see the big possibility to join forces with with the local startup ecosystem because they are the ones improving infrastructure from different angles. So governments have really neglected it to find. Channel, channels to reach out to those innovators that are locally typically and to do that in a systematic way and to be brave enough to, to really also engage them in the long run because we don't want just innovation labs, yet another innovation lab um, that showcases fancy things, but we want really that the homegrown technologies uh, across different areas are used for the services that they provide. Um, in production and um, there I think a lot of countries have still um, to learn a lot from the private industries in this respect and I think it's a pity because um, they had the chance to do a lot more a lot earlier now um, some initiatives appear but it's still I would say very early stage and um, especially of COVID I expect that um, the individuals are ramping up with um, yeah, with the mindset really that they can also um, change the ease of engage with, with local tech companies, um, especially to be to build more robust infrastructure and to, to build more future proof um, e services that you can um, interact with as a citizen um, in a way that you would expect it. No, that's uh, I'm completely with you. So, so one, one thing that you touched, but I want to go a bit deeper. So you mentioned that one of your areas of expertise in terms of Futurai and actually one of your services and technology is about the integration of cybersecurity capacities and a lot of the systems to, to tackle this use in cybersecurity. So tell us about your products, of course, uh, top level, but as well about how do you see cybersecurity for finance in general? Because it's the biggest area, I would say finance and healthcare, you touched that as well. But uh, <clears throat> we're still very, very fragile on that. I think definitely most of the banks have, uh, for instance, been seeing in the UK, like almost every month there's a bank that is act. Um, major insurance companies having serious issues. And, and this is actually right now a snowball effect. Even, even a, um, so how do you see that? And how can we be prepared for that? And as well, this is institution, but as well as users. So I would like to hear your opinions and views on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, what we do is we build a platform for strong authentication, which allows, again, um, having a modular <coughs> portfolio of authentication methods. Um, for us, it's important, we never know who the user is, so we are totally blind on the system. We, we are not an identity provider. Um, we plug on to the identity um, of an organization. So also from a privacy uh, perspective, it's very important. So all we do is we do 
um, with randomization. So we don't know um, who we serve, who we secure in this specific moment in time. Um, nevertheless, we try to leverage the knowledge across platforms, so um, across different customers to learn from behavior and from, from user interactions um, to increase overall security of, of the user. And this is, of course, interesting not only for the services that have a lot of interaction with users, <clears throat> like financial services, like retail banking. In retail, you have a lot of touch points of the user. If they log in into their portal, customer portal, but also, of course, if they log in into e-banking, if they sign transaction on their mobile banking. Um, so it's a lot of, of different touch points where we have information about the data, um, about the user, uh, what is a comparatively secure and what is a not secure behavior. Um, in other industries, like in insurance, you might not have so many touch points. Um, and so we can still add security by, by doing so. Um, however, this is just some of our future proof um, pieces of our portfolio. Um, complementary, we have also less data intense, I would say, um, products in place where we can do authentication and transaction signing. Um, so by simply, for instance, uh, push um, using a push authentication and that is enhanced with biometrics. Um, these are elements we would always combine and see what is the best fit for which specific use case. And um, coming back to the second point of your question um, about where, where the industry is heading in a specific time, I think um, the most incidents that we see about um, data breaches are really typically still because companies try to do their own security, um, which sounds appealing at first sight because it sounds sometimes trivial and um, what you want to improve um, in authentication or to build an authentication solution. Um, unfortunately, it's not so trivial. Um, and uh, it's also a big risk for an organization. And um, since this is not the core expertise, you really don't want to waste resources. It's not only costly to have a team dedicated to building a product in authentication in-house, it's also risky if um, individuals leave the company you're stuck with people that don't understand how to maintenance how to do the maintenance and how to update how to do security patches how to keep track of changes in the operating system so it's, it's like big it's legacy by the time basically you build it so there in, in security it's very important to to join forces with with really partners that have more modern ways of building software um, I would say um, since we started with Futura, it changed a lot um, towards SOS um, awareness and also acceptance across financial services. I would say in the early days, companies were not used to um, work with SOS services, SOS products. And now this changed quite a bit because the, the large advantage is really that you have always something that's up to date. Um, that you can benefit of innovations that are constantly integrated into an offering. And especially in cybersecurity, speed is everything. So you need to be very quick in being able to address new threat models that come up. And I would say that's one of the major um, shifts that I see, that you move away from long-term IT projects that are maybe building <clears throat> yeah, static technology, a product that is brought into production and then you have a check mark about something you have done um, versus really this new way of having a sauce where you um, maybe iterate on a new product launch and over time you add a new way of security and you have it already in the REST API so you can just adjust the front end to what you need but you don't have to add the whole infrastructure piece and that is already there and procured as a service. I would say that is really one of the, the major game changers in, in the way how you can bring speed to addressing cyber threats. No, very, very interesting. So I want to touch, uh, and uh, we're close to one hour, so I would just ask two last questions. So the, the first yeah. one is, um, with COVID-19, we are having an acceleration of digital transformation. And like you said, for instance, I, a, a, a very small example, I, I just uh, created a new organization. I was trying to open a bank account, even with my own bank. 
Mm -hmm. I spend literally six hours on the phone oh. trying to do something. And, and something that gets me completely crazy. You could just use an AI chatbot and try to do it. And then I, get it. I, I really don't understand how this is possible. And actually, the customers are, even with Wi-Fi, for instance, I, I have the most expensive package in the UK of Wi-Fi. Mm. And they don't have any way for me to connect to them. And this is about one of the biggest brands in the world, actually, both of them. So I think there's definitely... I think it's criminal almost that these organizations are this because they will be, let's say, even in my case, I will, as a financial uh, industry professional, I'll be the other one just as a security. So there's a lot of things happening from the government, from finance, from all our different things. So my question is, how do you see the COVID-19 as an acceleration? There's a lot of studies right now talking that COVID-19 is accelerating probably 10 years of digital transformation in the space of one year. And I know mm -hmm. a lot of companies, banks and organizations and actually governments will have to accelerate things. How do you mm -hmm. see that in Switzerland with your experience, with your partners and as well with your business? I would say uh, the acceleration happens on both supply and demand side. Um, on the demand side, the consumer, we, we, we noticed a large tendency and trends to really onboard individuals to digital services that before boycotted them because of privacy concerns, because of maybe um, that they were a bit lacking tax heaviness. Um, so a lot of our customers, retail banks and private banks, they have um, onboarded a lot of their customers that have in the previously been served face to face. Um, so this is a big push to using services. Um, this of course also enables the ones driving the digitization within organizations. Um, so the ones that always um, wanted to push the different channels, that wanted to add new functionality, um, like think of uh, insurance, you want to have claim handling over uh, your insurance app, not just to see the records. And um, so the ones that were driving, adding new processes and features, they really also um, became, um, uh, yeah, enabled through, through this increasing demand. And then um, the last element is really the, one, the, the leadership. Um, as I said before, these type of leaders that before said it's kind of cosmetics to do digitization, it's nice to have, it's something fancy to use for marketing. Um, the ones that blocked and did not see a need to really embrace into renewing infrastructure from the inside and also with, with the right partners and building ecosystems, they understand it's the only way to survive in the future and um, so that gave gave a big boost to to the ones that were opinion leaders within the organization and, and to the early adopters uh, of the markets and yeah especially in financial services i saw of course this whole acceleration happen in a super small amount of time i appreciate and that i think it's the only way to go so last one and to wrap up so um, tell us about the food to ride present state, uh, what's your vision, how you are coping with the COVID-19 and how as well, what's your roadmap? Because I'm sure this is a great opportunity for you guys to grow with your expertise, with your knowledge and as well as industry food thought leaders. They were providing both software because one of the things I see with companies like yours is that it's not only the provision of services and, and a lot of uh, software and, and strategy and consultancy, but as well, you are leaders in the industry. And that's a very important thing that we need more than ever. Yeah, so uh, for us, it's an exciting time. Um, I think we had the fastest project ever in our lifetime, <laughs> um, where companies um, that use us for typically end-user authentication for their consumer-facing applications also wanted to use us for employees, for, for use cases internally. Um, so yeah, we have a lot a faster adoption than typical um, for us, PSD2 is still extremely important in the near run um, since um, in UK extended um, the time for adopting PSD2 strong customer authentication in 21. Um, so this is um, still very important for us. We are replacing legacy products uh, for banks and to make the user acceptance higher and to, to really um, decrease support requests in the respect of authentication and transaction signing. Um, again, we have a lot of projects right now for passwordless solutions in other industries um, that are catching up with their infrastructure. Um, if we talk about more long term, <clears throat> I would say this B two market is is constantly something we're we're improving and and being close to customers 
to iterate fast if you see a new threat model coming in. Um, to give you an example, <clears throat> we noticed that a lot of banks were facing so-called social engineering attacks lately uh, by fake support. Um, or phishing emails um, is also a big topic during COVID, but um, fake support um, typically relies on, on they ask the user to download plugins to get remote access, since it's something that is also fairly used during, during COVID time. Um, but um, what they do is they ask them to log in securely with the second factor to their e-banking or their mobile banking, and then they should execute a small transaction symbolically to test if the system was infected by a malicious software. Um, of course, since it's a, a malicious hacker, um, nothing is actually affected. But what happens is that the hacker can, once the user has made a small transaction of one pound, of one euro, to an IBAN, um, this IBAN is whitelisted in the fraud detection system of the bank. And later on, um, the malicious um, hacker can just um, execute larger amounts of, of transaction. And so we have come up with a new product that we have integrated in our portfolio where we actually track if there is an anomaly uh, uh, that could um, coming from some other third party software that the user had to install, um, really in view of um, blocking the transaction that it cannot be executed. So when, when we talk about transaction signing, and authentication, we really think holistically and we are very quickly in, in addressing upcoming new threat models and, and um, issues that, that arise. And in the long run, it is really, today you have um, financial transactions you do over typical web or mobile interfaces, but uh, if you think of the future, um, you might generate data for your clothes, you might generate um, data you interact with with devices um, at home, and you will also be able to do financial transactions over those, uh, be it in e-commerce or, or others. And so um, what we are heavily investing in research into is looking at what are user interfaces of the future, how can you do banking, as such um, with those user interfaces and use some novel approaches to be able to serve those markets already today. Um, like one of the most prominent examples is um, voice banking. So uh, if you do uh, banking over smart home devices, we have authentications uh, in place today that are seamless that you don't feel for the user. Um, we use again our context technology for that. Um, that like these are elements where we constantly innovate and we're excited for what's yet to come. Oh, very good. And I think that's, uh, that's a very strong vision. And I know that you, you are doing a fantastic work. I know that it's not easy as well to do what you're trying to do because it's very sensitive. So congratulations to all the work and as well for all the, the accolades and, and prizes as well they've been winning. Um, I don't so know much. if it's just as a lot. You know, completely is a pleasure. I don't know if you want to just say where people can find you, finding Futurai. We'll put all of that, of course, in the interview, but it's always good coming from you. Of course. Um, yeah, we would be really excited to talk to anyone who is struggling <clears throat> securing their um, external interfaces. If we talk about web or mobile, um, we're very happy to, to support you. And reach out to me. Um, you can find me under Sandra at futurea.com. Um, you can find us www and futurea.com we are on linkedin twitter facebook uh, reach out through whatever channel um, is most convenient for you and we are looking forward to having a discussion with you personally thank you so much sandra and uh, uh well looking forward to catch up and hopefully you will create to become a, a new unicorn and actually find a lot of solutions for all of us thank, thank you, you. Have a good day. so much for having me yes thank you